Dear esteemed guests, faculty, honorable delegates, and board members, welcome to the 13th annual Georgetown Qatar Model United Nations. My name is Randa Ashab. It's my honor and privilege to serve as Georgetown MUN Deputy Secretary General. My first MUN conference was in 2008, and I still remember it vividly. I served as the delegate of Netherlands in the Environmental Committee in Paris MUN. I was pretty lost in the beginning, but it was so exciting that I just continued going to conference after conference, doing MUN year after year, and jumping from one position to another. Throughout school, the thrill of each conference was truly indescribable. Um, and here I am in my last year of university, and, I'm, and here I am in my last year of university, and I'm still doing MUN. The board members have come a long way in planning the conference. When you're a Durga, you don't necessarily, necessarily realize the tremendous work that goes behind the scenes. Every little detail was thought through and planned. It was tedious at times. But seeing all of this coming together, seeing you all here in the Qatar National Convention Center, knowing the topics we, we carefully chose are about to be debated, and seeing everyone well prepared is all very rewarding and exhilarating. The world we live in today can be unjust. Food insecurity, hate crimes against refugees, and gender inequality are all things you came across in your committee topics. But when I'm saying that the world is unjust, I'm not just talking about world hunger, poverty, wars, and inequality. I'm talking about a world where presidents of the most powerful countries are having a, a fight over Twitter about whose button is bigger. In, this, in such a scary world where everything's possible, what each and every one of you does matters. And that is why our theme for this year is redefining the role of the individual in the information revolution. There are two caveats to this. First, when debating topics in your committees, you have to understand the responsibility of regular citizens in the age of technology and malleable, malleable borders. Second, and most importantly, what you delegates as citizens of the world debate, draft, and think matters. It matters today because you learn different perspectives, and it will matter tomorrow because you are the future. Finally, we have four days of debate and learning that are waiting for us. I wish that by the end of it, you can leave with great memories and greater knowledge. And it's up to you to make it count. Thank you. I chose Georgetown because of its reputation as a world-renowned institution that helps students to reach their potential because of the resources and tools that are available at our disposal. And I believe it's the best bridge for the future. I chose Georgetown University in Qatar because it is an excellent opportunity to have a world-class university in the Gulf. Within our small student body, we have almost 50 nationalities, which means a lot of diversity, and I was able to engage with a lot of different people from different places while still maintaining a close relationship with them. My family and I, we've lived overseas for many years. Before coming to Georgetown University in Qatar, I taught in Beirut, I taught in Hong Kong, and we were looking for another really great international experience. But not just anywhere, we were looking for a great institution, one that had really strong students and excellent colleagues. And ultimately that's what drew us here to Georgetown University in Qatar. Faculty here at Georgetown are very experienced. Uh, they're very professional, they come from a diverse background. And with that background, they bring their own perspectives um, to the classroom, which is very unique. Faculty members come from all over the world. We have faculty members from the US, from England, from Ireland, from France from Nigeria, from Lebanon, from Egypt, from China. It really is a global faculty. 
I know a lot of my friends are involved in Model United Nations and Debate Club, and there's also a couple of extracurriculars that even take students out on cultural trips to different countries in order to, you know, go to the places that we're learning about and visualize and see, um, you know, just outside of the classroom as well, like what, how we're, what we're learning and how it affects the real world. Outside the classroom, I'm involved in a program called HELP, uh, which is very specific to Georgetown, Qatar, and it's a program where we teach English to our service workers. We all see each other as part of the Hoya community. They're all also part of the Hoya community, so once a week we dedicate uh, two hours to teaching them English. Another thing that I'm involved in is a peer-to-peer -peer dialogue with Gaza students that's very unique to Georgetown, Qatar. Outside of my classroom, I do multiple things. I play sports. There are uh, sports here in QF. I go to friends' houses. I've made local friends, which is fabulous. My favorite club would be Georgetown's debate team. I've traveled to uh, different universities here in Doha, and I've debated against different schools. It's all for fun. There is a competition, but it was wonderful because I get to see what other, uh, other students may think about a certain topic that I had a different view on. When my students come back to visit me after graduation, I'm always proud of what they've accomplished with their Georgetown degrees. Good evening, Mr. Clayton Swisher, guests, colleagues, and of course, above all, delegates. On behalf of Georgetown University in Qatar, I would like to welcome you to the 13th annual GUQ Model United Nations Conference. The GUQ Model United Nations has been a tradition since 2006. The theme for this year's conference is redefining the role of the individual in the information revolution. We're excited to be part of your journey over the next couple of days and hope this MUN will be an enriching experience for you, fostering personal growth and guiding you to be unique individual, individuals in today's world of unlimited information. I urge you to take this opportunity over the next two days to think about what it means to be a responsible person in today's world of information overload, to develop the skills to analyze information critically, to make intelligent and ethical decisions. We hope this experience will help you grow as global citizens and the skills you learn here will help you tackle the crucial issues you will face in the interconnected yet diverse world of today. I wish you a good stay in Doha and I recommend that you experience Qatar and its culture, not just the halls of your conference, but also the city, I hope, and its culture, and also connect with your international peers in this conference. Welcome once again, and wish you the best for the coming sessions. Sorry. <laughs> I now call on Amber and Yonsuk to, to come to the podium. Hello, my name is Amber Folk Ryan. My name is Yunsuk Choi. We will now recognize the schools participating in the 13th annual Georgetown Model UN Conference. When your school's name is called, we ask that you stand up and remain standing. Kindly hold all your applause until all schools have been called. From Qatar, Academic Bridge Program. Please hold your applause until the end. Al Bayan Preparatory School for Girls. Al Jazeera Academy. Al Maha Academy for Girls. Al Manar International School. Al Maha Academy for Boys, American Academy School, American School of Doha, Amna Bint Wahab Secondary School for Girls, Ausaj Academy, Blythe Academy Qatar, Bright Future International School, Doha Academy School, English Modern School Al Khor, English Modern School Doha, Lysi Franco Caterian Voltaire, Michael E. DeBakey High School for Health Professions in Qatar, Middle East International School, 
Newton International Academy, Noor Al Khalij International School Doha, Philippine International School, Philippine School Doha, Qatar Academy Doha, Qatar Banking Studies and Business Administration School for Girls, Qatar International School, SEK International, Stafford Sri Lankan School, the Cambridge School, the International School of Shwefat, the Lebanese School of Qatar, the Next Generation. From Ethiopia, International Community School Addis Ababa, the Greek Community School of Addis Ababa. From Ghana, SOS Herman Minir International College. From Jordan, the Baptist School of Amman. From Oman, Muscat International School. From Pakistan, Lahore College of Arts and Sciences. From Palestine, the American International School in Gaza. From South Africa, African Leadership Academy. From Turkey, ENKA Technical Schools. FMV Ozil Ayazaga Isik Lisisi. ITU GVO Ekrem El Ginkan High School. Ladies and gentlemen, the participants of the 2018 Model United Nations Conference. Please remain standing for the recitation of the Model UN Honor Pledge led by Isaac Khan of Georgetown's Class of 2020. Good evening, everyone. Delegates, please turn to the Georgetown University Model United Nations Honor Pledge on page six of your program. Please repeat after me. During this conference, During this conference I, will do my best I will do my best to find out, find out as much as I can, as as I can about, the country, about the country or organization, or organization I, am I am representing. I will converse with my peers, with my peers from, countries from countries around the world. In a, in a civilized and respectful manner. Respectful manner. Despite multi-party and, multi and often heated debates, I will try to remain calm and composed. I will respect the fact that people hailing from different cultures, from different cultures having different conceptions of the, of the norms of social interactions. I will not only adapt to that, adapt to that but, take but take it as an opportunity to enhance my intercultural understanding. Intercultural Thank you. Please be seated. Now it is my pleasure to welcome to the stage a member of Georgetown's class of 2018 and Georgetown Model United Nations Secretary General, Nayab Rana. Thank you, Isa. When was the last time you watched the news? read the news, or your phone lit up with a news alert. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, these headlines do not consist of the most pleasant information. More likely than not, we're bombarded with news of tragedy or violence from all around the world. But I'm sure you already knew this. My next question to you would be, what do you do after receiving this alert? Do you say a quick prayer in your mind, make a comment condemning the news, and then with the swipe of your finger, dismiss the notification? Many times not even going as far as to read the article, because you get the gist of it. If you're silently nodding your head and agreeing with me right now, I promise you you're not the only one. I'm right there with you. The 21st century and its technology has granted us with access to information from all around the world with the touch of a button. 
We are blasted with so much information on a daily basis that I feel like we've stopped fully processing it. We receive news regarding hundreds of casualties because of a natural disaster or an explosion or a mass shooting, and we process it like any other piece of information. We're accused of being desensitized. And though that does indeed play a role, I think it goes beyond that. I believe that the issue stems not from our absence of reaction, but rather the uncertainty of what our reaction is supposed to be. And that exactly is what the board has decided to take up as a theme of this year. But rather than giving you this whole speech, we decided to condense it into a phrase. Redefining the role of the individual in the information revolution. We as a population have access to immense amounts of information. That being said, choosing to be aware of the world and its events today has become an easier task. However, where I feel that we fall short as a population is in our reaction. We're living our day-to-day -day lives embodying what I, be to, what I feel to be a very limited definition of what it means to be a citizen of the world today by simply observing. But aren't we capable of more? Aren't we responsible for doing more? What does it mean to be a citizen of the world today, in 2018? What is the role of the individual? These are the kind of questions we want you to apply in the next four days of debate. Regardless of whether your committee is debating the rights of the Rohingya refugees, privacy in the digital age, or curbing air pollution, ask yourself, what is my responsibility as an individual in the world today? We are not here to simply abide by the status quo, but rather, I want you to question it. We as individuals choose the roles and responsibilities we wish to have, and the legacy we wish to leave behind. Others may have already figured theirs out. What's yours gonna be? In the next four days, I want you all to push yourself and think about how you want to make a difference in the problems that plague our world. You are the leaders of tomorrow. So use this conference as a test arena for your future plans. This is your conference, and I can't wait to see what you all come up with. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to an amazing conference with you all. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to introduce the keynote speaker for this year at Georgetown Model United Nations 2018 conference. Mr. Clayton Swisher. Good evening. I'd like to thank Georgetown University for having me um, address you uh, this evening and the Model United Nations for organizing such a well-attended event. I joke that uh, I thought that there might be 10 people and four of them would be my family in the audience, but clearly they assigned some sort of um, points for you guys to attend. And so I'm relieved to see all of you here and hopefully I will um, leave you with some things to think about in the next couple of days as you go about debating what's taking place in the world around you. When Nayla Sherman was kind enough to extend this invitation to me um, and inform me that the topic would be the information age, it took me about a nanosecond to agree to do this. Um, first, because the information age is something that I've been um, swimming in my entire adult life um, as a journalist, and in particular since I moved here to Qatar in 2007 to begin working with Al Jazeera. Now in 2018, I think the United Nations and others rightly recognize that the availability of information through digital platforms is in fact a revolution. I agree with that premise, but I also think the phrase global information war could just as easily apply. Here's why, and I want to unpack these ideas um, in the next couple of minutes with you. Last year, it was estimated that more than 50% of the entire world's population had internet access. In the instances that I'm about to describe, those internet users represent the main combat forces engaged in the information war. Whether they like it or not, or whether they want to be at war or not, they are. Those not connected to the internet at all, they may be the victims. Though if digital information somehow skips over the air gap and makes its way into a newspaper, which goes on to influence them, then they too are every bit of the front line in this information war. 
So pretty much the only true victims of what I'm about to describe to you are folks totally disconnected from the internet, from any form of news, and to be that person, you might as, might as well be an Amazon tribesman or living in a, a cave somewhere. Most of us are connected, and that's where we're at right now, at the center of an information war. And like any, any global war, there's campaigns taking place all around us. I'm gonna to speak to you this evening about two, and they're very much interrelated. Many of you will have followed what is happening in America, and if you don't, you should, because it absolutely affects you. Despite its superpower status, it turns out many Americans are unprepared to assess the credibility of things they read, and we're finding out what a problem that is. There was great controversy surrounding the 2016 U.S. presidential contest and allegations of interference by Russia. Now, I'm, I'm not going to get into how the United States has interfered in the elections um, of other countries, including democracies, going back to Mossadegh in Iran in the 1950s. We'd be here all night. That's a valid uh, angle of attack, and I, I welcome you all to explore it in your studies. Um, but there's a very instant problem about how the Russians went about this disinformation campaign that does have an immediate application to every country in the world right now, and we're seeing others mimic it. I'm going to drill down on some specifics of this brazen type of information war um, and describe for you how it's put not only America at a perilous point, but it threatened to put this country at a perilous point. So unless you've been living in a cave, you will have heard on the news how a special prosecutor was appointed to investigate the role played in um, the 2016 presidential election of um, Russian interference. And just last week, Robert Mueller, the prosecutor uh, running the case, indicted more than a dozen Russians who were operating an online troll factory that was creating digital avatars purporting to be American citizens, mostly pro-Trump, and who were whipping up the passions on Facebook and Twitter with paid promotions to ensure their content got widely read. By using fake news and with the intent of creating a pro-Trump narrative or echo chamber, these Russian bots use social media to help turn Americans against themselves, to convince whites that African Americans were radicals, that Muslims are terrorists and enemies they cannot trust, that only Donald Trump could lead the country and keep it safe from terrorists, and that Hillary Clinton is corrupt and belongs in jail. I'm not sure they needed Russia's help to make that point. A lot of Americans felt it anyway. <laughs> it's true. Thomas Jefferson, an American founding father who literally drafted the Declaration of Independence and served as president, once wrote that wherever the people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Democratic theorists tend to agree and interpret that remark to mean that an informed electorate is essential to good democratic practice. So what's that even mean? Well, if you don't know what's happening in the world around you, you're hardly going to be in a position to hold your own government to account and its policies to account because you don't know whether what they're doing is legit, whether it is based on um, principles that your country stands for or whether it's you know, built for all, our ulterior motives, the personal financial greed of whoever may be developing that policy. You have to be aware of what's happening in order to contribute back to the people that you've elected into higher office. You can't have a meaningful relationship with democracy if you don't know what, what's going on in the world around you. And that means you have to have a reliance on information that comes to you most often from journalism. Um, if you were to get your information purely from the government spokesman telling you uh, what they want you to know, you'd be seriously misled and as a result, not prepared to hold it to account. Similarly, if all you believe as an American is Facebook postings by someone named Tony Smith who you've never met, and who in reality is operating from a nondescript building in St. Petersburg, feeding you Kremlin propaganda, you're probably also going to be misled and deficient in participating in the democratic process. And apparently that's been happening a lot. That's the purpose of fake news, to confuse and to confound people. For the Russians, it's a form of political warfare or active measures, which equates to disinformation. To succeed, the content needs to be believable enough or play to the passions that people want to hear so believe so that it will motivate them toward political action but let's leave aside the suckers who fall for it there's a whole other segment and this is the real tragedy the real casualties in my my view the people who suffer are the ones that don't trust the fake news 
But they're so confused, they're so deluded and bombarded by the information that they don't know who to believe. They throw their hands up and they say, I don't know what's true anymore. CNN says this, Al Jazeera says this, but my Facebook feed's telling me this. So what do they do? They shut down. They say to heck with it. I, I can't tell this from that and I'm busy in my life. And they stop believing in journalism. And when they take that road, it leaves a clear path for the highly motivated, angry bunch who have bought into the fake news so that they can march towards their objective and cast their vote. So while confused folks sit at home, the distorted view becomes the electoral reality. And what happens then? If people stop believing or caring about what's happening around them, governments become unaccountable, able to manipulate their subjects any way they want. So you see, ban Muslims from entering the country, lock up immigrants. It's all in the name of security. And if you disagree, as we see with Donald Trump, they just get on Twitter and say, don't believe so-and-so, it's fake news. Indeed, even as Russia has been doing its job to poison American democracy, we have the fruit of that election, Donald Trump, waging a full campaign to discredit media and lessen American confidence in journalism. It continues until now, but it's helpful to recap. During the 2016 campaign, as serious journalists questioned Trump's background and fitness for office, we saw Trump responding by inciting hatred and violence against journalists. At his rallies, we saw reporters who asked difficult questions booed or physically removed from events. In many instances, the president used his Twitter account to cyber bully journalists who offered critical coverage. He even mocked a disabled journalist. In a sense, who needs Russia when you have the president of the United States doing the job of weakening American democracy for you? <laughs> Fortunately, Americans are waking up to this problem and the correction of this distortion from the global information war that I'm describing is gonna take several years. It's gonna result in an overcorrection. We might even be going there now. Twitter and Facebook will likely turn to censorship. Groups will be set up to identify and label organizations peddling fake news. There, there may even be, and there are some efforts in Europe to criminalize fake news. And that might gain some currency in, in individual American legislatures. But America has a population of 320 plus million people. Um, and I would say even its realization of this problem, it's, coming, it's starting to get its head around it very quick. Um, and others are going to, other, other countries, other democracies that are going through this. There's elections in Europe that are being influenced in such a way. Um, I think that there's going to be a quicker reaction and a quicker response than many can anticipate. I want to touch on another campaign in the information war now that's closer to home, and it affects a much smaller population. I think you know where I'm going with this. Qatar, at this exact moment in time, has quite a lot in common with the American public. To the extent that it was the target of an information warfare campaign that began last June 5th. And it was I think, just after Fadzer prayer um, that night. And for whatever reason, my wife, who's also a journalist, she was up and naturally, as journalist wives do, I do it too. We were checking our Twitter feed. And she says to me, oh my god, the, the neighbors are announcing an embargo. I'm like, no. She's like, yeah. So I, I get on mine and I look. And they're, they're doing a, a, a blockade. Now, a blockade, that's an act of war. When someone blockades your borders or air your sea, that's serious business. I didn't go back to sleep that night. Um, and, and from then on, the games began. But what I can tell you, um, you know, the, the games began on the June 5th. Um, but in, in reality, it had been going on for quite some time. The website hack of Qatar News Agency formally started the party, if you will. But in the months leading up to this lynching, there had been a flurry of opinion pieces in major U.S. papers appearing out of nowhere to condemn Qatar for having it both ways and supporting terrorism and demanding it choose sides in the war on terror. Again, this is out of nowhere. Failed U.S. diplomats like Dennis Ross who advocated Israeli rather than American interests their entire careers, were especially prolific in the weeks before the siege, writing in newspapers that Qatar needed to stop funding Islamists and calling on the U.S. to remove its military base from al Udaid here in Qatar. The Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, which is a D.C.-based NGO, it advocates pro-Israel policies under the guise of an American flag. They were particularly energetic. 
They organized anti-Qatar events, including one on Capitol Hill, which we now know from Emirati Ambassador Youssef Oteba's leaked emails was egged on and encouraged by him. Many in this room, many in this room know that I'm, I'm the director of investigative journalism at Al Jazeera um, and that a year ago we did an undercover investigation into Britain's pro-Israel lobby. Um, those of you who followed that may know that we have another addition. We concurrently ran an undercover operative in the United States, um, and we will, um, inshallah, I'll be soon bringing that project to broadcast. I can tell you tonight, in advance of that airing, that our undercover operative in Washington secretly filmed a senior Israeli official boasting to a small, trusted gathering about how the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs has partnered with the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy as part of its covert influence campaign inside America. When this footage is broadcast, and I hope you'll watch, groups like FDD and others we filmed will have plenty to answer for regarding whether they are American organizations advocating American interests or simply fronts for Israeli intelligence. Given all the attention to Russia's influence in America, the Israeli impact on American democracy has long got a free pass. All of you should know that pro-Israel distortion in Washington has similarly affected U.S. policy towards Qatar and not to its favor. Having observed how this anti-Qatar momentum was building up ahead of the siege, I remarked to a Qatar friend at the time, this is not rain hitting your face, it's spit. Your country's under attack, and until you realize what kind of war this is, you'll continue to be on the defensive. Fortunately for Qatar, they had the facts on their side. Aggressors that moved after them had a horrible sense of timing, perhaps thinking that they could pave over Qatar in a week and, you know, with fake news and have a puppet leader installed. As the GCC crisis stretched out for the summer, the Qatar's terrorist narrative pushed by the embargoing country was met by very skeptical, very, very skeptical U.S. media. They had seen all the paid advertisements, and I was in D.C. this summer. My God, were they cheesy. These infomercials that's, you know, out of nowhere in the news bulletin, it says paid by the Saudi Affairs Committee and, you know, Qatar, and, and you know, the Saudis go on to lecture about how Qatar is really the terrorism culprit. It was just bizarre. It was out of place. People were very alive to what was happening. And um, along with the, the disclosure, I think it was in July, um, that the Qatar News Agency was hacked um, by uh, people under the control of the United Arab Emirates. The Washington Post reported, citing intelligence sources, that the UAE had fudged the Qatar News Agency website. And um, it was quite embarrassing how the American public learned it was done. Uh, the details were made public, including people in Abu Dhabi were clicking refresh at, you know, in the middle of the night on a Tuesday to see if the, the, the hack had gone through, leaving a, you know, a, a signature from their IP address um, and making it very easy for the FBI and other investigators to find out who started this fake fight. So all this began to unravel. And, um, and that's, that's, that's been to the benefit of those who would like to see this, this conflict lessened or eliminated. Um, um, but again, it, the, the common feature of using information, using the internet, using distorted media, very much a, f a feature in the Qatar conflict, and it was very much hoped by the people using these tactics that it could undermine confidence in the government here. I'm going to leave you with some advice on how to better fight the information war. Or if you're not a fighter, how to at least have situational awareness about the information you receive before you act on it. Is there anyone here in this room that, well, let me, yeah. Is there anyone here that does not use a smartphone? Anyone rock a Nokia 3G? So I can't see any hands, and people probably don't want to admit to it if they do. Um, that means pretty much all of you bearing those phones, you're in the trenches of the information war I'm describing. Again, it doesn't matter if you like it or not, if you want to be at war or not, your pawn's in it or your fighters, but you're in it. Others are deciding for you, governments, political parties, businesses, think tanks, media outlets, bloggers, academics, they're all vying to shape your thinking. Apple and Samsung especially want to cash in what they know about you. So does Google. 
Your smartphone metadata tells Google where you are, whether in airplane mode or not, by the way, and how long you stay where you are, whether you're driving, whether you're walking. It can tell that we're in the same room together right now because our phones are communicating to the same cell phone tower and they're gonna see us walk out of here and switch to the next cell phone tower and go back to our homes or wherever. So without even listening to our calls, it tells a lot about our activities. It can tell the approximate height and weight um, of the person that uses the smartphone based on the movement in your, in your pockets. It can, talk the way, it can tell the way you walk. It can tell how long you sleep, how well you sleep, which websites you go, which websites you visit. And like Santa Claus, it knows whether you've been naughty or nice. <laughs> Seriously, if you were to begin researching diabetes or high blood pressure on Google regularly, your digital profiler might think you suffer from this medical condition and start slipping paid advertisements from health or pharmaceutical in makers into your feed. In reality, you know, you might just be researching a paper for a high school, but never, every time you log in, you're going to be bombarded with all these having high blood pressure ads and these medicines that you're like, no, I was doing something for a health class. That's a sign of, of the, the, the signature, your digital signature that you're giving away. Again, you need to have situational awareness of this because it informs how people who want to target you will approach you and what they'll approach you with. So the first lesson uh, that speaks to is be aware of any information sent your way. It may be an advertisement triggered by an algorithm predicting your interests or activities, and it may convince you to need something that you don't. It might be an email solicitation that feeds your fears rather than cures them. You don't know. So question why you're being sent advertisement, business solicitations, or any information. And don't ever click on an email that says, I've got a million dollar proposal for you, just click here to... I'm serious, people, people do. It's malware. You can avoid that by doing what I call the, the taxi rule. I don't think any, does anyone, well, I won't ask if anyone knows the taxi rule. As a journalist, I travel to a lot of countries and when I get there, um, obviously I, I need to get you know, local transport to get where I'm going. So uh, I never, ever accept to drive with someone who approaches me. You always pick your taxi at random and however you want, but you be the owner of that decision, not let someone make that um, or help you with that choice. Just um, mitigate that kind of risk of funny business. It's, you should handle that the same way you handle online solicitations of people that come to you in general in life, I think. Second is to recognize that journalism is a profession. It's a deadly serious one. Anyone here about to do their compulsory military service? I know one of the panelists, he just finished his in Korea, he was telling me, is anyone here looking to enlist or do their military? Okay, I don't see many hands, but um, I could say I hope, I hope that you have a very boring, uneventful tour. Um, Thank God I did. I, I joined the Marine Corps after high school, and the most action I saw was in training. It wasn't until I became a journalist um, where I saw the horrors of war. So it was airstrikes in Gaza, my first visit there in 2002, um, the aftermath of the Lebanon War in 2006, Gaza again in 2009, Afghanistan deployments in 2009 and 10. Um, in, in those deployments and in those situations, I put myself in harm's way, um, along with my cameraman, to bear witness for the world and to get those stories out. Not out of boredom, but so that others around the world might see the evils of war and make a choice, hopefully to end those wars. That's my agenda. I had one, to report and inform about the futility of the Afghanistan war and the cost it imposed on the Afghan civilians and young American kids who didn't know the first thing about the country they were fighting in. That wasn't a game, that wasn't an amateur venture, this was a profession, and we handled ourselves professionally, and we reported professionally. And I know that in my reports, I got feedback from people in the White House over policy issues that I raised. So it was taken seriously. Those of you who are from Qatar, have you ever been to the Abu Hamur area? for funerals, yeah? So I went, to, I went to one 
um, my wife and I have a colleague who, um, Ali Hassan al Jabbar, in it would have been March 2011, we buried Ali after he was killed uh, covering the Libyan Civil War. He was a cameraman, and he's very well liked, and he was very good at what he did. And what he was doing wasn't a part-time hobby, it was a profession. And it was to inform all of you about the war that Muammar Gaddafi was waging against his own people. He paid the ultimate price so that everyone around the world could see the reality of what was happening in Libya. My third point builds on um, the second one, which is know your source. This is, all, this, is, this is what it all ties into. If you're gonna be using uh, digital information, you have to know your source. Um, believe it or not, most people can't tell the difference or know, recognize what a sketchy website looks like. If CNN.com has just a few too many ends and it says breaking and it's like this crazy headline, people will share it and they say, oh, that's not really CNN. But it'll, it'll go around the world before someone recognizes that. Um, as jur journalism is a profession deserving of respect, you should also approach it with skepticism. An Israeli broadcast about the last Gaza war will substantially differ from Al Jazeera's. Ask yourself why. But what if you don't know that it was an Israeli news organization? Another revelation that will be made in our forthcoming documentary centers on the Israel's lo Israeli lobby's use of websites in America to distort news so that they are pro-Israeli without Americans realizing it. We will tell the story of one such group that our undercover stumbled on. Um, and if you go to Facebook, it's called Cup of Jane. Okay, Cup of Jane, you'll see that it has more than 460,000 followers. So our, our undercover was invited in discussions about how this group was used. And very cleverly and very, you know, very deviously, they put out legit news stories. And you know, nine stories might be legit news. And then they slip a pro-Israeli one as number 10. You won't notice it because it looks like a steady stream of legit news, but it's subtle, okay? And when our undercover, when his cover was still protected, it got blown a year ago, they did not say on Facebook that this is a project of the Israel Project. They did not disclose that it was a pro-Israeli news site. After they learned our undercover had been in those meetings, they put up, this is a project of TIPS, DC Information Office, and who knows what TIP is? It stands for The Israel Project. So our film, our film, when it comes out, is going to blow the lid off of this and other, um, other cutout fake media um, websites that are being used. Quite humorously, there was, there was one exchange. I don't want to give away everything, but it's four hours of television. Um, they were talking about how it annoyed them, AJ+, Plus, which is an Al Jazeera um, product. AJ+, Plus are short. You guys know what AJ+, Plus is? You guys see AJ+, Plus videos? They are saying, you know, it really stinks because we like AJ+, Plus, but as soon as they touch Palestine, ugh. So they, wanted, they want to set up something to mimic it and, and, and to make it pro-Israel in its orientation. Um, so know your source. Um, a few years ago, my daughter, she's here, Jenna, she'll remember that I downloaded an app on my iPhone for her to play with, and it was called Amateur Dentist. And imagine what Amateur Dentist app would be. So there's this guy sitting in a dentist chair, and you have to do some complicated, you know, um, filling or tooth extraction, and you're using, like, you know, pliers and a little shot of this and a hammer, and the guy's making faces, and you get points for making him the less amount of pain. Um, I bring up that metaphor not only to embarrass my daughter, but also to point out the absurdity of going to an amateur dentist. So just as you would not go to an amateur dentist in life to clean your teeth, don't go to amateur journalists. Don't go to people on the internet that play journalists, and if they put it in your Twitter feed or, or, or in your Facebook, whatever comes to their mind, take that at face value and be skeptical of it. Question everything, now more than ever to fight and survive this global information war. And collectively, we can all become better for having fought that good fight. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time. May you all have a successful conference in the coming days. And though I'm not supposed to make it political, free Ahed Tamimi, free Palestine.
Thank you, Mr. Swisher. My name is Samira Al Hajj Abed. I'm the I'm the chief of communication. I would now like to ask all committee chairs members to stand up upon hearing their name. United Nations Environment Program President Maryam Al Harthi, Vice President Fatma Farouqi, Rapporteur Khansa Maria. Disarmament and International Security Committee, President Yun Sak Choi, Fiza, uh, Vice President Fiza Shahzad, Rapporteur Adam Pulako. Historical Security Council, President Walid Zahor, Vice President Maryam El Hababi, Rapporteur Tala Kamar. Human Rights Council, President Omar Al Khatib, Vice President Salma Hassan, Rapporteur Manah Al Nadim. International Court of Justice, President Wesley Chen, Vice President Mudassar Reza Chakir, Rep uh, Registrar Sara Abdel Ghani. Special Political and Decolonization Committee, President Samir Al Hajj Abed, Vice President Malak Al Muh, Rapporteur Nadine Al Dehebi. Security Council, President Lamia Al Thani, Vice President Lina Noor al Din, Rapporteur Hiba Muhammad Noor. The United Nations Economic and Social Council, President Aiza Khan, Vice President Abida Diab, Rapporteur Talal Abdel Nasser. Thank you. With, with the powers vested in me by the Georgetown Model United Nations Student Board, it is my distinct pleasure to officially declare the 2018 Georgetown Qatar Model United Nations open.